welcome to this lecture. Uh, in the last lecture, we had discussed about uh, introductory topic on object oriented design and we had said that UML, the unified modeling language has become a de facto standard for object oriented design. Uh, we saw that uh, UML has evolved over the years from the techniques that existed in those days. And uh, we also saw that modeling using UML consists of creating many types of diagrams. And the first diagram to be constructed while modeling a problem is the huge case diagram. Huge case diagram is the central diagram because that uh, portrays the customer's view of the system. And therefore, that is the model, the huge case model needs to be constructed first and all other models that are constructed subsequently must conform to the huge case model. Let us uh, first discuss about the huge case model how to construct the huge case model for a given problem and then we will discuss about the other models that need to be de developed as part of uh, software development exercise. Let us first look at the huge case modeling. The huge case modeling captures the user's view of the system and it consists of a set of huge cases. The huge cases are something uh, similar to a high level requirement, but then here we have a graphical formalism to model a huge case and also have a text description for each huge case that gives the specifics or the details of what happens during execution of the huge case. There are various models that need to be developed as part of a software development exercise. The structural view in terms of class diagram, the behavioral view etcetera, but uh, just see here that we have drawn the user's view at the center to imply that uh, this is the most fundamental view of the system, it captures the requirements of the system as the user views the system and that is basically the requirements. And therefore, for every development the huge case model is the one to be constructed first and once the huge case model is developed the other models can be constructed, but they must conform to the huge case model. Another thing we need to point out that uh, even though this is part of an object oriented development, an object oriented design technique, but then the user's view is not really object oriented. It captures the various functionalities that the system performs and uh, therefore, we can say that all other models are object oriented model in the true sense whereas the huge case model is a, is not a object oriented model actually we don't show the objects and so on it's in fact a functional model where we model what are the functions that to be performed using the system but then what exactly is a huge case a huge case as we had said is a similar to a high level requirement, but then the way it is defined here is a way in which the system can be used by users to achieve some specific goals. That basically is a high level requirement for example, let us say a library software it has various categories of users the members of the library, the librarian, the accounts department and so on. 
the users of the library that is the members they use the software to issue book, return book, renew book, search for book etcetera. So, we can say that those are the huge cases for which the user is the member. As far as the librarian is concerned, the librarian also uses the library software, but uh, for him he does member record creation, member record deletion, book record creation, book record deletion, checking the availability of a book etcetera. So, those are the huge cases or the high level requirements from the perspective of the librarian and similarly for the account checking the total investment in the library, the total fines collected over a period and so on. So, the huge case is similar to a high level requirement, but here uh, we represent it differently. We have a graphical representation of a high level requirement which you call as a huge case and also we have a text description as is any functional requirement it only details the functional behavior without uh, revealing the internal structure of the system. But as uh, we will see that uh, each use case has a set of scenarios we will see what are the scenarios for each use case how to identify and how to document those scenarios as we proceed in this lecture. As uh, we were just mentioning that for any software we can ask the question that how do the users use it. Each software has various categories of users we just took the example of a library information system and we said that the users are the members, the librarian and also the account. As far as the members are concerned, they issue book, query book, return book, renew book and so on. As far as uh, the librarian is concerned, the use cases are create member, add book etcetera. So, given any software we can consider it to be like a uh, black box and we can think of it as uh, offering various functionalities to the different categories of users. So, if these are the functionalities being offered by the software and the different users for those software those functionalities we can represent it in this form these are the functionalities we will write the name of the functionality and also represent the specific users for those functionalities and this becomes the graphical representation of the use cases. Uh, for this example, we will write issue book, query book, return book etcetera as the functionality for the member and for the librarian create book, add book uh, sorry create member, add book delete member record etcetera. So, those are as far as the librarian is concerned and this is the member and this is the account. So, we get a very um, impressive view a very simple view of a system where just by looking at the diagram we can relate that what does the system have to offer to different categories of users, who are the users and what are the different categories of functions that they can perform using the system.
but uh, one question that if we identify the different use cases, can we say that all use cases are independent of each other? For example, let us take about the library information system. You can issue book, return book, renew book, etcetera let us say from the members perspective, library members perspective, but are these different use cases really independent, because we drew them as independent use cases, they have no dependencies that is what we drew them separately, we showed no dependency between them. Okay, to answer this question is that as far as a first level view of the use cases are considered they are all independent, but if we probe down there may be dependencies. For example, issuing a book by a member may be dependent on another member whether he has reserved. So, if a member reservation use case. Uh, there will be a dependency of the issue re use case with the reservation use case, because if the same book is reserved by another member, then it cannot be issued out. So, if we look at the details of various use cases, we might see that there are dependencies, but then we do not show those dependencies here in the use case diagram but it is good to uh, remember that uh, there can exist dependencies between different use cases. Uh, we are just saying about renew book and reserve book, this is another example actually that uh, if uh, somebody member wants to renew a book, then he goes and presents the book, but then in between if another member has reserved that book, then he cannot renew it. So, the success of the renew book depends on whether another member has uh, reserved the same book. So, there is a dependency of the reserved book, uh, the renew book is dependent on the reserved book. This is the model, very simple elegant model here for the use case model. Every use case represent by a ellipse, write the name of the use case typically the name of the use case is a verb, because uh, each use case depends a functionality or action being performed. Write the name of the system here and then write the use cases and the different users, different categories of users actually, because there may be many players, but then we just represent the class of players here. Similarly, for a library system there may be many members, but we just draw one stick icon this is called as a stick icon and write member here. So, that denotes the member category of users and there is a line connecting from the user to the use case indicating that they are associated or the user can invoke the play move use case. And there is the system boundary, it indicates that what are the functionalities that are available within the system boundary. If a, a system has multiple religious, then we can draw different boundaries here. For example, I might draw a boundary here and write that let us say uh, find expert player or display expert player. So, in the next version so I will write here tic tac toe game version 1 and tic tac toe game. version 2 display expert 
and this will be the user is a uh, administrator. The administrator can display all the expert category of players and this will be done in the version 2. So, this boundary specifies all the functionalities there can be other functionalities the functionalities that will be done in version 1 and the functionalities that will be done in version 2. But in any case the boundary can be drawn to indicate even if there are no versions to indicate that what are the functionalities that are available. But sometimes the boundaries are also not drawn as you can see in different uh, books, literature, tools and so on. Sometimes the boundary is not drawn only the use case and the actors. So, the boundary is not really a mandatory requirement for modeling a use case, it is the ellipse indicating the use case, the association relation and the user, the boundary is uh, optional, but it helps to show clearly what are the functionalities are available and we normally write the name of the software. But before we look at the nitty gritty of the use case diagram, let us see what are the uses of the use case diagram. We can easily guess that it serves as a requirement specification, a very elegant one. It first gives a graphical view of all the requirements and then it is also accompanied by a text description which uh, gives the detailed behavior associated with the requirement that is what does the system do, given an input how does the system behave or what does the output that it produces. But uh, that is understandable that we identify the requirements which are the ellipses, but how do identifying the different categories of users that is the different categories of users are called as actors in the UML terminology, how do how does identifying the actors help in developing the software, does it have any role? Yes, it has role, when we identify different categories of users, uh, we can imagine the different user interface that each category needs. Let us say a software has a factory workers as a category of user and the system administrator is another category of user. The factory worker they need a very simple interface because they are not very familiar with the software, very elaborate user interface where they are prompted to enter some. Uh, data they enter it and so on. Whereas, the system administrator he does not need a very elaborate interface, he needs an interface which would work very fast. So, he can just press some keys and get things done very fast, whereas for the factory workers there will be prompt for everything they need to do and that has to be in very simple format. The second use of identifying the actors is that uh, it also helps in preparing the user manual. If we can identify who are the users, the user manual can be developed by targeting that those. For example, if factory workers are the user of the software, then the user manual has to be written in their language in a very, very low level description, very, very simple understandable description will be there. But if the software will be used by system administrators and computer experts, then the user manual can be can assume certain background knowledge and it can be presented at that level. So, identifying the category of users is helpful as the development proceeds, first is in developing the GUI part 
and second is uh, preparing the documents, especially the user's manual. The representation of the use cases we had seen, it is drawn as a ellipse, the system boundary is drawn by a rectangle, the users are called as actor, they are represented by stick person, these are the terminologies we must be familiar while using the UML, the actor, the use case and the association relation between the actor and the use case. This is also called as a communication relation or association relation, it is drawn by a line. Uh, sometimes we need to represent an external system, because uh, one software, one system might interact with another system. So, we can consider the other system to be a kind of a user here and we represent the external system using the same stick person icon and uh, we just annotate that which we call as a stereotype, we just annotate that saying that it is an external system. For example, let us say in the game backup need to be taken for every game the backup is made on an external system. So, we represent the external system using a stick icon, but we just write here within these two symbols, these are called as the guillemets and this is called as the stereotype. The external system, this is actually a system not a human user, but then for simplicity we represent it as a stick icon and we write that for the backup, the external system is involved and the backup is taken on the external system. Let us see what does the connection mean, the line between the actor or the user and the use case. The line indicates an association relation or a communication relation, the user invokes the use case or the user uses the use case, but then it does not indicate that he will input some data etcetera, he may just invoke it. We do not capture here data flow unlike in a DFD where we discussed about external entities and we are interested in what kind of data they input. Here we do not capture the data flow, we just indicate here that the user uses the use case. This is another example that uh, the faculty is a category of user who can update the grid. This is yet another example, this is a video information system. There are many use cases here, just represented one of the use cases to explain what is indicated when two actors are connected to the same use case. it indicates that this use case can be invoked by both these actors or for the success of the use case execution, two actors are involved. One implication is that if there is another actor here, let us say a user, they can independently invoke the use case, but here the implication is that both need to participate. The clerk when he rents the videos, the help of an external system is taken for credit authorization. So, 
before a person who wants to rent the videos presents his uh, video rec uh, VCR, the clerk takes that and enters the details and checks whether the member is credit worthy by using an external system automatically it is checked as part of this huge case and then the rent video will be success otherwise if is not credit worthy the rent video will say that uh, the video cannot be issued. So, we will often draw multiple actors using the same huge case they collaborate for successful execution of the huge case. This is another example here, this is a telephone order system, here in this commerce application we have uh, the customer can place order through telephone, can check the status of the order, the customer can place order and check the status of the order and also while placing the order he needs to establish the credit possibly by entering the credit card number etcetera. The details of those what really happens will be given a separate text description, but here by looking at the diagram we can uh, see that the customer can invoke three functionalities of the telephone order system and check the status, place order and establish the credit. The sales person can help in placing the order and the sales person also can check the status. The sales person can himself or herself place an order. The shipping clerk fills the orders and dispatches. The supervisors he is involved in establishing the credit. So far we have looked at some very basic concepts in huge case modeling, looked at the graphical representation of a huge case diagram. Uh, right now we are nearly at the end of this lecture, uh, we will stop here and in the next lecture we will discuss about some details of huge case modeling namely how to decompose a huge case. Sometimes the huge cases are complex and we need to represent them as uh, separate huge cases by decomposing them. We will see how to decompose what are the different techniques and we will also see the text description how to write the text description for a huge case. Uh, we will stop now. Thank you.